we all have an internal radar that causes us to size up another person, usually even the first time we see them. And sometimes we will even make a judgment on another person based on what they look like or where they come from or where they are on the economic ladder. And we don't know anything about them. But there is this internal motivation that we have. And I wonder if it's out of self-protection. Maybe because we live in such a diverse world. And here we are, the first week of the Olympics is completed. And you look at the Olympics and you see a wide variety of different kinds of people, different kinds of cultures, different ethnicities. And all of these people, at least for two weeks, come together on the same stage and they compete but it's done in the spirit of the Olympics, isn't it? It's done out of competition, yes, but at least every four years, for a couple of weeks, we see people that are vastly different than each other, able to compliment and congratulate other people who win a gold or a silver or a bronze. And maybe it was their dream to win that gold or silver or bronze, but out of good sportsmanship, they will offer their congratulations. Now, all of that goes away once the closing ceremonies are done. <laughs> we move back into the real world, don't we? And we will judge those very same people that played in the Olympic Games. And what we find is we make a judgment that there are good people and there are bad people. We make that judgment by observation. We make that judgment by experience. But underneath it all is our own self-perception. And I think that because of our own self-identity, we have to feel we're better than someone else. So we might reflect this in a variety of ways. This brand is better than that brand. I only wear Nike. You will never catch me in a pair of Skechers, right? We make this evaluation of one brand being better than another brand. This city is better than that city, okay? Super Bowl Sunday, Cincinnati and L.A., okay? L.A. is going to win every time because it's a better city, right? Mm, maybe not to everybody. This team is better than that team. This religion is better than that religion. This country is better than that country. This race is better than that race, and the list could go on. We build a case for we are better than, trying to use facts and experience, but much of it is really our own self-identity. It's how we view ourselves we all kind of carry some emotional and psychological ID cards. And we find ourselves in the fabric of society somewhere, at least where we think we fit, and where other people will not acknowledge that we fit into that. Maybe they have taken their own identity and they have politicized it or used it to polarize groups. Think about concrete social identities that people identify with, and then the movements that come out of them. Black lives matter, yeah. Blue lives matter. See, why is it one or the other? White lives matter. Gay lives matter. You know, what's amazing to me is our self-identity becomes the primary lens through how we interpret the events, and the people around us. And then there comes an incident that occurs in a complicated world. And we think that someone is always to blame. And if we can identify a particular group of people and pin that on them, then our social problems would be solved. That's called social scapegoating. And if it goes far enough, 
sometimes what we find is it becomes quite violent. On November the 9th, 1938, there resides a catalog of human crimes that is listed in a book called The Night of Broken Glass. And on that dreadful night, Nazi stormtroopers smashed, ransacked, burned, and destroyed Jewish homes, synagogues, and businesses throughout Germany. Emil Fackenheim was among 30,000 Jewish men arrested and taken to concentration camps. But at the age of 22, he managed to escape. He moved to Canada, and he became a Jewish philosopher and a reform rabbi. And in 1982, Fackenheim wrote a book called To Mend the World. And it was a reflection on the Holocaust. But in it, he talks about tikkum olam. That's a Hebrew phrase, repairing the world. That the purpose of his book was not to cast blame, even though there was blame that should be cast upon what was done to him, The emphasis of the book was that we should be about repairing the world. And though the world is broken, it's not beyond repair because God's intention is to work through humanity in order to repair the rifts between people and nations. When Christ comes and proclaims, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, He did so establishing a new social identity, not built on ethnicity or economics, but on an exclamation of good news that all people matter to God. So last week when we started this series, we talked about how everything is spiritual, they're interconnected. But when we come back to the book of Acts chapter 8 this morning, I want us to see that out of persecution came a new experience, and Philip leads the way. The beginning of Acts chapter 8 says, On that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Stephen had been stoned, and people scattered, and Philip goes to an area called Samaria, And as he does so, he runs into two individuals. So everything is spiritual, and every person matters. These two individuals that Philip runs into, I've talked about one, an Ethiopian eunuch, but I haven't talked about the other one yet. He runs into an individual by the name of Simon the Magician or some people call him Simon the Sorcerer. And it raises a question. This first person that Philip meets, does he matter, or is he on the outside looking in? So let's encounter the text here as we come to Acts chapter 8. If you have a Bible, turn to Acts chapter 8. And I'm going to read for us the part of the paragraph that talks about this guy right here. His name is Simon Magus, and his story is told in Acts chapter 8, verse 9 and following. But for our purposes this morning, we want to look at just a couple of verses because his story goes beyond Philip, and the apostle Peter will confront this man, Simon Magus. Now, When you run across someone like this on the street, the first thing you might say, is this man homeless or is this man dangerous? In verse 9 of Acts chapter 8, we're told about Simon the magician. And straight up, he is a self-absorbed huckster. We're told that here in the text. Look at verse 9. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. So if you want to know what his motivation is, 
He was very self-congratulatory, right? Look at me. Look what I can do. It says here, all the people, both high and low, so there's a social strata there, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. So if any of you have ever taken in a magic show out in Vegas, you will ask the question, how did he do that? How did he pull that off? And somehow it's very believable, but we all know it's illusionary. It's a way of catching our attention and distracting us in order to get some other things accomplished in the program. This man here, it seems to be one of the forerunners of those type of magicians that was able to amaze people. But we know that his motivation was all for selfish purposes. Verse 12 goes on and says, Jesus is going to grab the attention of the people of Samaria through Philip. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized, both men and women. And Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. Now remember the beginning of chapter 8 Philip had the ability to perform healings in the power of the Spirit. And Simon catches notice of some of these things. And how many of you have ever seen um, the show Fool Us by uh, Penn and Teller? If you've ever seen that. Magicians get up and they perform their act and then Penn and Teller says, this is how you did that because they know behind the scenes how they perform some of these tricks. But Simon is unable to do that with Philip, because Philip's power was genuine. It came from God, and he was performing miracles and healing and that type of thing. And while Simon, in his act, was pulling the wool over other people's eyes, he actually is wondering about Philip. And so he follows Philip everywhere he goes. We're told in the next paragraph that Peter and John, two of the apostles, come to Samaria when they hear of all the good news of people turning to God. But in verse um, verse 18 here, it says this, When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. And said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So what he does is he sees this power and he thinks, hey, I can purchase this. And then I can continue to use it for my own advantage. Peter says in verse 21, your heart is not right with God. And Simon recognizes that, and he responds to the Apostle Peter and says, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. Here's an individual that looks beyond hope. And maybe you were one of the individuals that was suckered by his act. Maybe, just maybe, you would write him off Maybe you would say he's beyond hope. But he believes and he gets baptized and then he needs to clean up his act a little bit and that takes some time. He covets religious authority to broker the power of God, but when he is confronted by Peter, he repents, he changes. His motivation becomes that which is not so self-absorbed. So here's this self-absorbed huckster that somehow comes to God. 
And we are just given the first few steps of his character transformation. All people matter. Even those that we would like to stay away from and those that we might be suspicious of and those that we think are up to no good. We don't know everyone's story. We don't know their circumstance. We don't know why they do what they do. We don't know the burdens that they carry. One of the things that we do recognize here in the text is Peter confronts him when he does do wrong. So we're not talking about not making a judgment when we actually see people misusing their power, their position. But for the most part, Philip baptizes this individual that he could have said, you're beyond hope. Just turn around and go home. Now, Philip reaches out to him, and it becomes the first step. So that's the first individual. Here's the second one. The text goes on and says in Acts chapter 28, verses 26 through 31, that there is this Ethiopian eunuch that travels all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem because he wants to worship the God of the Jews. And Philip is going to have a divine encounter with this individual. Let me remind you of what it says in just the first couple of verses. In verse 26, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of the treasury of the Kandaki, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. And this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home he was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet, and the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot, stay near it. Then Philip ran to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet, and he says, do you understand what you are reading? And he says, how can I, unless someone explains it to me? So he invites Philip to come up and sit with him. That's where we're going to stop. Next week we'll talk a little bit about what they talk about in the chariot. The first thing I want us to understand, though, is here is a gender transgressive foreigner. A gender transgressive foreigner in the eyes of dedicated, committed Jews. Eunuch is a strong word. It is something that was done in the ancient world to men, usually boys, where they are castrated. They are done so because they're going to be put in charge of usually overseeing a harem. We don't want any funny business going on, right? among all the women in the harem of important rulers. But here's this guy who had probably been taken at a young age, and he does not check any of the boxes of someone who should be allowed to come to Jerusalem. No way. Number one, he'd be seen as an immigrant. Even though he's in a chariot, and even though he's important, but that's in Ethiopia. Ethiopia, that land of darkness, that land of immoral vices. And I'm sure when he travels to Jerusalem, he's a pretty conspicuous person. I wonder if he heard the jeers of the community in Jerusalem. You don't belong here. Turn around. Go home. He reminds us of those that have the challenges of not fitting in. Immigrants of all times are unfixed, vulnerable people for whom being at home is a fortunate situation. And they often suffer physical and psychological and social damage. 
And there's often a lot of stigmatizing. And they are forever regarded as outsiders. Here's a man that just doesn't fit in. But the Spirit prompts Philip, taps him on the shoulder, and he says, go out to the wilderness. There's a guy out there in a chariot. And I want you to meet him. I want you to stay near that chariot. I want you to engage in conversation with him. And he does. And this man, who had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and we're not told in the text how he was received when he went, but as he's on his way home, he has a scroll at least part of the book of Isaiah as we know it. And he's reading it. He doesn't understand it. He's scratching his head. Who is this portion of Isaiah talking about? That's next week. We're going to talk a little bit about what he read. But Philip asks a question. Do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch said, well, how can I unless somebody helps me? Come up, sit with me. You know what's amazing to me here in these two encounters is these two individuals, Simon the magician and the Ethiopian eunuch, would normally be people that maybe the apostles would just overlook or turn aside. But the Philip is being, uh, Philip is being tapped on the shoulder by the Spirit, and he reaches out to Simon, and he reaches out to the Ethiopian, and he engages without judgment on a personal level. There's always someone that we don't want in our chariot. (laughs) But thank God there are people that invite us into theirs. There's a lot of conversions going on in this chapter. Simon is converted. The Ethiopian eunuch, as we'll see next week, is converted and gets baptized. But I wonder if it's in the book of Acts, because you know the one that's really being converted is Philip himself. He's been given a commission to go to Samaria, those despised Samarians. And it's there, he has these two encounters. Is there someone who will genuinely accept me for who I am? I'm wondering if that's the question on their mind. And Philip's message is good news. There is a God who tells you that you matter just as you are. No one is ignorable. No one is disposable. No one is a mistake. Every person, whether a genius or an individual with special needs, is the carrier of an everlasting soul. And there are no gradations in the image of God. Yes, there can be differences in gifting and resources and opportunities because we are all different. But in terms of dignity and value, everyone's the same. There's no little people in God's kingdom. There's no social Darwinism in the kingdom of God. There's no survival of the fittest in the human community that's a part of God's family. No, 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 no. Those who are powerful and privileged and handsome and rich and wise, who often command attention in this world, they're on the same level as the weak and the physically and mentally challenged and those that are socially ignored and those that are poor, those that are disposable sometimes in the eyes of people. This passage tells me that every person matters. And that includes you. That includes me. 
There's a scholar by the name of Walter Brueggemann. I want to read something out of an article he wrote as we conclude today. He says, the issue of inclusion is not only disputed among us, it is also urgent. It is urgent because we U.S. Christians live in a society that is profoundly exclusionary in ways that are deliberate. While we popularly celebrate the large vision of democracy among us, it is the case that the reality of socioeconomic political power works primarily to divide and exclude, to distinguish between haves and have-nots, so that the haves always have more and more, and the have-nots have less and less. In the face of such exclusionary inclination rooted in fear and anxiety, a church faithful to the gospel is summoned by the Lord of the church to challenge such exclusion and to practice an inclusiveness that is as broad as humanity and as deep as God's generosity. In the current battle for the Bible, biblical texts and themes that witness to God's generous inclusiveness are not much known or cited among us. But in Isaiah 56, the prophetic poem reflects an argument about inclusion and exclusion. The prophet witnesses to inclusion by insisting that foreigners and eunuchs, the others in an ordered Jewish community, are to be welcomed precisely because the community gathered around God is for all people. Do not let the foreigner join to the Lord, say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And do not let the eunuch say, I am just a dry dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Wow. Isaiah chapter 56, verses 3 through 5. Jesus came into this world a child of a poor couple. But he offers a kingdom to all people. Not just to his own circle, but to everyone. Maybe Philip, in these two encounters, learned what seeking the Lord is like. We continually need the equivalent of Simon and the eunuch to show us that every person matters. I'm telling you, here in the book of Acts, when the church is just getting started, there's this strong message. The message is, remember, that exclusion is emotional violence. Exclusion is emotional violence. Would you join me in prayer, please? Lord, when we look at the life of Philip, we see that there are individuals that we normally would turn aside from. And we are aware that maybe we might prejudge individuals that look and sound like people that we're not comfortable with. But help us, Lord, to build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live. A place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive. May it be built on hopes and dreams and visions. May it be built on the rock of faith and the vault of grace. May the love of Christ end all divisions within this place. May we remember that we have been welcomed and we should welcome as well. Keep our eyes open this week, Father to touch someone that has been excluded in some way. 
and to say thank you for being in this world. For you are a gift from God. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with us today. May God richly bless you. May you have a great week. And may you enjoy Super Bowl Sunday. God bless you.